Your father carries his passport in his back pocket. You laugh with embarrassment every time he brandishes in the air like a machete for the white people to see. What about the young ones? The children of immigrants who, unaware of their skin or tongue, spend the early years nicknaming Khadija Tiffany, Yasmin Rebecca, until a summer comes thick with realization, blackens their skin, thighs fill up, back arcs, lips thicken, and when they walk, men stare like they have a nest of fireflies dangling between their legs. Who tells them about home? Their father using English proverbs to fill the gaps between his teeth and past. You want to say, Abe, tell me about home. Tell me about the days you spent on the boat when you saw God's face in the moon and your wife's mouth in the sea. Tell me about how you prayed on the shore and prayed to a God that you didn't believe in enough to forgive you. How was it before the war? What did you see there? What do you miss? Who were you there? What did you run from? But what if he tells you what he had to do to get here? What he ignored, what he witnessed, what he partook in. If he was running from a person or the person had he, he had become, had your father raped, maimed, killed? Are you ready? What are we honoring in keeping our father's mouths closed? What is it that makes our skin crawl every time we hear father's old friends calling old nicknames like bullet, flame? Can we piece ourselves together on the memories of old men who can barely sleep at night? Children with the parents of the war are raised with a home thick with secrets. Why do your parents no longer touch at night? What do they do to get the money here? Abe, do you have children back home? What happened to their mother? Your father cries one afternoon when you ask him where the deep scars on his legs come from. He howls like a dog at a cemetery and you just want to hold his body. Sit with him until the red tide of his memory comes in. Now you understand why he brandishes the passport in the air like a machete. He's just trying to wipe the slate clean of blood. Why don't you let him? Ali says he saw the dog eating the baby on the street. He said a lump the size of his wife's cancer stood in his throat. He said he didn't know what to do, so he called the police. Jamila says she saw the woman leave the baby there. Kaltun says it wasn't a woman, it was a girl. Sahra knows her daughter's stomach was swollen, heard her grunting in the bathroom, cleaned the blood from the floor afterwards, but didn't tell anyone. Zakaria says he isn't the father, but he has half moon scratched into his neck and back from her nails, but he swears on several surahs that he didn't touch her, but if he did, it was because she wanted it. The girls at the local schools arch their eyebrows, ask each other with slanted mouths why she didn't drink a gallon of honey on her third month if she didn't want the baby. The local boys high-five each other with unsettled stomachs, each thinking of the girls they kiss and touch behind Abu Bakr's falafel shop. One of them makes an empty joke. Yaqe, <laughs> she should have come to me if she didn't want it. I would have kicked that sharmota in her stomach. The other boys look at the ground and exhale, wondering if the baby looked like any of them. The policeman wraps it up in a white sheet mumbles some prayers been under his breath a small crowd gathers the air smells like a riot he finds himself cradling the bundle before lowering it into the ground a barren woman collapses an old man throws his kufi a woman with small eyes says that the mother should be buried alive in the child with in, with the child in the ground in a town filled with bleeding skirts it's anyone's guess whose warm spit whose bloody thighs whose stifled throats these babies are coming from. <laughs>